Real Talk, Indiana's premier talk show on real estate investing, where we talk each week about investing your money right here in central Indiana. The tips, tricks, do's, and don'ts brought to you by Cyria, central Indiana's oldest and largest real estate investing association. Hello there. My name is Vicki Perry, and I'm the executive director of Cyria. We have over 600 members, all active in or learning how to be active in real estate here in the Indiana market. This radio show is available on FM 95.9, AM 950, podcast on YouTube, and www.cyria.org. Join us each week as we talk about how you can make your money more active with better returns and help the community that you live in with real estate done the right way. Now, on with the show. And hello, my name is Ron Watson. I am the board president for Cyria, Central Indiana Real Estate Investors Association. Welcome to Cyria's weekly show where we talk about investing in real estate the right way. We're here to help you understand the opportunities available to you in real estate investing, whether you're just getting started or a seasoned investor. If you've missed previous episodes, you can listen to them on the Cyria channel on YouTube or tune into it on our website www.cyria.org on the calendar of events. Um, also joining us today is one of the most successful wholesale investors and coaches in central Indiana, Brett Snodgrass with Simple Wholesaling. Welcome again, Brett. It's always a pleasure, Ron. And joining us as a father and son team who are active in the central Indiana market as landlords, flippers, and wholesalers, Pete and Isaac Barrow, owners of Parrot Home Buyers. Welcome back to the show, gentlemen. Good morning, Ron. Thanks. So we wanted to get started with you guys. I know that uh, we have had you on the show before. We talked a lot about wholesaling and why you chose Indianapolis to invest in. And today we'd like to talk more about landlording and the challenges that that can bring to uh, all of us who are landlords. Can you start us off by explaining to our listeners your philosophy in landlording and a little bit about what that actually means to uh, to you guys? Uh, okay. Well, uh, I'm not sure you'd call it a philosophy because uh, we didn't go to school for it. But uh, I guess the way we think about it is it's it's like any other business. If you provide something good that people want at a good price, they'll buy it. And if you don't, they won't. Uh, there's a, the thought, you hear the thought a lot, you know, greedy businessmen, greedy businessmen only hurt themselves. If you're greedy enough, no one wants to buy your stuff. You have to, uh, you have to provide something good and you have to, you have to not gouge people. There's, there's another saying I like, you can shear a sheep many times, but you can only skin him once. We don't really think of our tenants as sheep to be sheared, but uh, there's something to be said for the thought that, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't gouge people. They won't come back. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good philosophy, right, Ron? I, I think so. I qualifies yeah, in my book. That's yeah. right. I didn't hear that in my <laughs> philosophy class in college, but um, I wanted to really just dive into landlording in general. So... Uh, you have chosen to buy rental properties, manage those rental properties yourself. Uh, can you tell our audience why? Why would someone want to buy a house, rent it out? Uh, what are the benefits of that? Uh, what are the drawbacks too? If you might uh, talk about that. Well, I mean, the the benefits are obviously you get you get income out of out of that. Uh, you get you know if you continue to grow, you can get a good reputation. Uh, and drawbacks. I mean, the drawbacks are just obviously landlording can cause can cause headaches. I mean, I will give you a specific example. Uh, <laughs> I think this happened on Monday morning. I got a call from a tenant who actually had like a maintenance call. I figured she was calling about that. You know, somebody was coming to look at her stove, uh, and she calls and she sounds kind of like frantic, uh, <laughs> and a tree had fallen in her yard. Uh, and not just that, in the tree was a uh, beehive. Uh, <laughs> so, and uh, I tried to just adjust as well as I could, called over pest control, uh, you know, got the guy who we get to remove trees on the line, and when pest control came out, they determined that they were honeybees, so obviously they have to be protected. Uh, so for the last three days, I've called 34, 30 to 35 beekeepers <laughs> and just last night someone was able to uh remove them but 
So those are the kinds of th- drawbacks that I would say. It's just headache. Cl- clouds of bees. Wow. Head- I've heard a lot of stories, but this is the first that yeah, I've heard about the bees. Yeah. So really? yeah. As I'm, a, I'm a beekeeper, by the way. Did, did <laughs> oh, not I, know oh that. really? That's a fun fact. I wish I'd yeah. yeah. let, yeah. let me get I your card. Give you my number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, maybe you should mention some of the good stuff uh, other than oh, clouds well, of I mean, bees. Well, you got honey out of the Yeah, well. That's something. I mean, obviously, it's not all headache, but... Yes, if especially once you get to a point where you have a lot of rentals, you you will get stuff you have to deal with, you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, uh, whether it be you know maintenance, uh, emergency calls like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of a lot of positives to it. You, obviously, you get income for it, and you know your financial burden is a lot, uh, you know, less. Uh, so there are a lot of benefits and, and there are drawbacks, but I think it's important to just be balanced about it. You're not going to get rich over it, but but it is a good is a great way to supplement whatever income you might already have. Yeah, it's not quite passive. It's not quite as, as passive income as people think, but it is income. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I was kind of curious, uh, Brett. So the you know when you look at the types of houses that you're interested in and, and where you're going to. Uh, find those houses. Are you looking at, at owner-occupied properties and, and there's emerging neighborhoods, there's distressed neighborhoods, or do you focus on any particular areas or a combination of those? Or What's your guys' approach? Well, uh, in terms of how we analyze, I would say a lot of it is basically determined on house size, uh, you know, market rent. Obviously, we're going to commit a lot to these houses uh, financially and just mentally because we're always going to be thinking about how to improve uh the areas that we're that we're buying in uh and so we we base it a lot on area and obviously we prefer to buy in owner occupied neighborhoods but we're always keeping an eye out on areas that we feel are emerging or areas we feel are distressed and we we have we have a lot of people you know brokers in the area who are who are knowledgeable and we've lived here long enough to know know the areas uh, and and we have houses in a lot of these areas, so we have we use that sometimes as kind of a template. And in terms of how we sort of figure out what we're going to get, uh, that's primarily based on house size. So we kind of figure, you know, if if we have a three bed duplex in Mapleton Fall Creek, based on the fact that we have several you know three bed duplexes in Mapleton Fall Creek that pull in anywhere from seven hundred to eight hundred, that's sort of our template to say if we buy this house. We'll get you know seven hundred aside, seven fifty aside, eight hundred aside. So, I mean, we we like owner occupied neighborhoods, but we're always keeping our eye out for other places. We're always looking. I think one thing we've tried to do in the last year or so is just diversify a little bit. Try to buy more singles. Try to buy more stuff on you know the east and the south side. So, yeah, I think we're we've also found that you know we we really can't plunk down the money to buy in the the A neighborhoods and sometimes even the 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 upcoming places have already come up so so fast that we've missed out on them but you can always buy around the edge of these places you can always look for the stuff that's right in the path between two good neighborhoods you, you know if you if you're really willing to drive around spend a lot of time looking and talking you can you can figure out you know uh, which way things are going to creep and uh, get there first awesome that's what we try to do i want to talked about what you just uh, mentioned a neighborhoods b neighborhoods c neighborhoods uh i was kind of a B student, and that's probably where I fit in. I don't know if you're, you're probably C minus. Uh, uh, well, thank you so much. I, um, I, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but well, uh, what, uh, you know, our uh, audience—that's kind of like you know, real estate investing terms, and a lot of right. people don't realize what that is. So, if I'm someone and I want to buy some rentals, uh, and you start talking about these neighborhoods, what does that mean exactly? And what should I look out for when I'm looking at you know, A neighborhoods versus B versus C? And what does that all, all that mean? Well, I don't know exactly what the definitions are of a, a B, and C neighborhoods, but I, I guess I know them when I see them. You know? <laughs> uh, an A neighborhood is a place that we can't afford, where every, <laughs> just about everyone's an owner and everything is beautiful and elegant. Um, a C neighborhood is a place that's solid, uh, you know, working class. Uh, you're not scared to be there, or at least not too scared. Uh, and a B neighborhood is uh, somewhere in between the two, I suppose. Um, I don't know how anybody makes money in A neighborhoods. I guess people do. I know people who own and rent in A neighborhoods. 
and they like it because they have no no tenant problems at all, and there's no crime and, and so forth. But I think uh, as you as you get into paying that much money for houses, your return gets worse and worse. Uh, most of what we have is uh, C plus B neighborhoods. I guess that's what you'd call Mapleton Fall Creek. A lot of it a low B now. Um, I think the returns are better. Some people like what you'd call D neighborhoods, really distressed places because you can buy a house for nothing, do very little work, and you can still suck a little money out of it. But, you know, you're going to have constant constant headaches and problems. So uh, probably think, kind of, uh, you know, what you're meaning is the further you go down the alphabet, uh, the more headaches you have. Yeah. The pr- further you go up the alphabet, the less headaches, but maybe the less money I, I potential think that's as well. how it works. You you can probably, you know, there's, there was a guy who said, well, who said this? Was it Lincoln? Poor said, poor people are a gold mine. I, I know there are people who look at it that way, that you can get a really sorry house in a terrible neighborhood, and you can still get some money out of some poor person for it. But uh, it's going to be constant problems, and you can't really afford to maintain it. Uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, I guess somebody's got to, but uh, there's there's plenty of C, C plus, low B stuff in this town that's great, and you can get great tenants, and uh, you can afford to maintain it well, and uh, everyone gets along. So that's kind of kind of the market we're looking at. So uh, we only have about two minutes left in this segment, but do, when you're looking at those various uh, categories, and, and I know it's not a, it's not a scientific method that you're using for that, but do you find um, less problems, less turnover in, in 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 those categories, like a higher level A or Bs, or less turnover, or is it kind of just depends, or you can't really make a, a classification that way? Well, well I, I think we don't have that much experience across all these categories to say. Uh, I think. We have uh, pretty low turnover uh, right where we are, high C, low B. But I think, you know, we're very responsive and maintain stuff and have pretty friendly relationships with most of our most of our tenants. So uh, we don't have a turnover problem. What about um, maintenance issues, things like that? Does that kind of come into play when you're talking about the different categories of properties? Well, I don't know if there's a – I don't know if there's always a correlation because I would say – there are a couple houses we've bought that we felt were in higher B areas, higher sort of higher B class, uh, but have needed a lot of maintenance. And there's there are a couple houses we've bought where the bones, you know, maybe the area wasn't quite as nice, but the bones were a little nicer. So the maintenance has been more of a get in there, do what you have to do, and then from then on, there won't be maintenance calls outside of stuff that's, you know, things happen. I mean, things break. You know, stoves break. It happens, but <laughs> uh, but you know, I don't I don't know if that there's been a correlation uh, in terms of you know area and maintenance. <clears throat> but yes, generally speaking, the people who who own houses in better better areas and and will get better rent, take better care of their houses. So then, you know, when we come in and buy them, uh, you know, we notice that there's less maintenance because there's just a general care that has been shown. But it's it's pretty obvious. Well, that makes sense. And, you know, I think probably you'd find bees in any of those level of properties too, right? <laughs> it doesn't yeah, really matter. Yeah, They're not yeah. that discriminating. So yeah, yeah, this yeah. we're speaking with Pete and Isaac Barrow of Parrot Home Buyers. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back after these messages. And welcome back to Real Talk. I am Ron Watson, president of the board of directors of Cyria, and today... We're speaking with Pete and Isaac Barrow, owners of Parrot Home Buyers, and also joining us is Brett Snodgrass with Simple Wholesaling. So we talked a little bit about before the break the types of houses that you're buying and, and, and uh, some of the characteristics, but uh, we wanted to kind of switch gears, dive into some of the details around how to make landlording more profitable and stress-free. So I know you have some ideas on that. Can you give us uh, some of your thoughts? Well, I think uh, one of the most important things is, you know, obviously if you're a landlord, uh, you want to choose good tenants. Uh, you know, one thing we do is, is whenever we post a rental listing, uh, we go through it with our crew uh, and we we make sure, you know, everything obviously is functional uh, and we try to improve it from the previous, from the previous turn that it took. Uh, so we, obviously we go through and fix everything. We post all our rental listings on Zillow. So obviously it ends up going on Trulia. We post them on Craigslist. 
I post them on on Facebook as well. Uh, we just look for obviously we look for qualified tenants. We we look for tenants who we believe will be able to pay rent every month. Uh, but one thing we really do look for is somebody we believe is going to take care of the place, whether it be just you know keeping the place neat and tidy. But we look for someone who's you know genuinely excited uh, to be there, excited about the house. You know, the first time they see it. Uh, one, th- I mean, one thing that that helps us. You know, for one, it obviously helps if they're taking care of the place. But also, you know, just for the neighborhood quality of it, uh, we like when when people when people move into the house and you know maybe they can develop strong rapport with the neighbors and also then you know you gain a reputation as a landlord as somebody who moves in good neighbors that will obviously help the neighborhood because everybody in the neighborhood will like them. So I, you, you mentioned a really good point. I'm a, I'm a landlord and I know we go through some processes to get some good tenants, but what kind of tools do you use? You mentioned you want somebody that you, you feel like is going to pay the rent. How do you determine that? How do you gauge that? What, what process do you go to to kind of try to figure that out? Well, we just, uh, we obviously run a background check. We do an income check. We do a, a landlord verification just to verify that wherever they've lived in the past they've been paying uh the background check will pull up any kind of you know past uh felonies or evictions and we'll just make sure that you know there aren't any because that's not something we would want to get uh you know we would want to end up that would not be our end end game i guess is to eventually evict we don't we don't want to do that uh so those are the things we look for in terms of and in terms of how we find out that they're going to be a good tenant uh and yeah i mean just just making sure that they have steady income making sure they're you know paying whatever bills they have whether it be rent or utility bills and well, a, a maybe maybe it means like how do, how do you run a background check how do you do that yeah, what are some tools and resources that you guys use to to qualify <clears throat> the tenants where do you where do you go to well we use a property management service called buildium and through Buildium, the person can apply online, and then after they apply online, you'll send a credit check to them, which will pull all the, you know, all the necessary information, whether it be past evictions, past felonies. It'll also pull their their credit score, uh, so every everything you would want to know. And then obviously you can, in their application, they'll they'll uh, detail their you know their landlord's phone number their employer's phone number and you can call them and verify with so them. you so you uh you recommend calling previous landlords and talk to them about how did this tenant uh treat their property did they wreck it and then their employer um, just to verify all that as well so you guys go through that process yeah that's that's crucial it's crucial to have uh to have some sort of verification i mean i every tenant we've moved in i i will call their previous landlord, uh, and I will call you know their current employer, because sometimes people are looking to move. Sometimes people are genuinely looking to move, but sometimes people are looking to move because they're being forced out. Right. So <laughs> yeah. you want to make sure that's not <laughs> the case. Uh, and and even I mean with with any tenant, it's crucial also to just have a good lease uh, and to have a lease that you know very you know sh- strongly states and clearly states you know sort of what your policies are. So, on on the other, I mean, we he 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 does a very good job of screening everybody. But we about to rent to a guy who did ten years for homicide. Mm. Um, but in the ten years he'd been out, the guy was perfect. His mm-hmm. credit score was better than ours, probably. Mm-hmm. And we were we were delighted to rent to him. Then he turned us down. So really, <laughs> wow. Was good it, thing he didn't kill you. Did he do a background check on you and then that uh, Probably. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are too He turned the tables clean. on you. We, 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 the house had this nice big garage where he could store things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's a good story. <laughs> so let's. So you uh, you prepare and you qualify your tenants and uh, this homicide or whoever it is, um, <laughs> they look good and you're going to move them in. So they move in and first couple months um, – you know, doing well, but what are some other things when they're in the house that you do that is a little bit different to keep your tenants happy to, you know, build that relationship with them to have them keep paying rent every month and uh, and all that. Do you, do you have some um, advice on that? Well, just it's uh, it's about maintenance. I think. Uh, I mean, it's. I think uh, 
we've bought a lot of places from previous landlords that were just not maintained at all. And on those houses, we get maintenance calls. But what I've found with tenants is if they see that, you know, you respond, you come right out, uh, even if they, you know, even if you're in their house for a few days and they're inconvenienced, they seem delighted that you're just willing to take care of stuff, which tells me that there are a lot of landlords or have been in the past who weren't very willing to take care of stuff. So uh, I think it's if you want to be the people that uh, everybody wants to rent from, then uh, you don't want to do that. You know, you want to take care of things. And what we try to do is, you know, keep up with ongoing maintenance really well. And then anytime someone moves out, when you have to do what you call a turn, we always try to upgrade the place a little bit, come in and, you know, find one thing that really could be improved, you know, pull out some old wiring or plumbing, uh, you know, replace an old creaky water heater. Um, we're going to do one tomorrow. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll spend a week just going over the house and upgrading it a little bit. And by the time you've done that three or four times, you've solved a lot of problems for the tenant and yourself. So you mentioned something I was I was wanting you to dig into a little bit more detail. You mentioned the lease, having a good lease. Are there some key uh, uh, parts of your leases that, that um, are really important from your perspective? I mean, I know they can be long, and I don't want to get into too much detail, but there's probably some key factors that you guys include. Well, I, I can give a couple specific uh, examples. Uh, one, one thing I think to enforce uh, and, and to be very clear about is – whatever policy, and I think a lot of us have the same policy about any kind of noise complaints, uh, any kind of criminal activity, I think it's important to notify that note on the lease, you know, sort of what your stance is on, you know, getting noise complaints from neighbors. We recently got a a noise complaint from a neighbor uh, on a tenant that we didn't actually move in. We inherited the tenant. uh, And I think it's important to note on the lease and just say you know we don't we have sort of a a zero tolerance policy for getting noise complaints getting you know calls from neighbors saying you know did you did you move these people in uh i think that's important i think it's important to say what your what your pet policy is uh because sometimes you know people you'll, you'll say on a lease oh we will allow you to have two pets and then they'll move in three pit bulls yeah so a shark (laughs) so so i think it's important to say what what just very clearly outline what your policies are outline what your late fee policy is uh outline you know what the lease dates are uh i think that's important uh just just to be very clear in in what your what your specific policies are for things like pets and criminal activity and noise and just general maintenance just you know note on the lease that you expect the tenant to generally take care of the place and keep it generally clean because you know sometimes they they don't do that uh, and that can invite all kinds of problems whether it be neighbors seeing it and not liking it whether it be the house just being generally dirty which is bad for everybody so I think it's important to just be clear about what your policies are yeah just be transparent I think that that's uh, super key so when a problem does arise you can yeah. go back to the contract and see exactly what everybody agreed to at the beginning yeah. Um, so let's talk about, you know, the maintenance stuff and, and contractors. Do you guys do all of your own maintenance <clears throat> or do you hire stuff out to other contractors? Uh, we do a lot of our, our own stuff. I've done uh, handyman work and carpentry and cabinet making for a hundred years. Uh, so <laughs> I do a lot and we're fortunate that, uh, I've stumbled across a guy, a, a handyman who can also do everything and, uh, the guy has incredible talent and skill, and uh, he also has a weird knack to just whatever weird little part that you happen to need, he'll just walk out to his truck and come back. <laughs> I mean, he, he did this the other wow. day. I needed a re- pressure relief valve for a water heater, and I was like, oh, now I'm going to have to make a, make a run. And he said, well, let me go out to my truck. And he, he came back with the very thing, you know, so, <laughs> of course. so that's a, that's a great service. But we, uh, through him, we know a huge network of people a lot like him who are incredibly good and reasonable in their price and just really, really good, solid people. And we have a plumber who, you know, the, the skilled trades, the plumbers and electricians, we have a plumber who he's great. He's inexpensive. Uh, and I think his philosophy is kind of like ours. He, keeps his prices down and he just works all the time to make up for it uh he works 
every day. I, I think he just doesn't want to go home or something. <laughs> <laughs> so you think that that's important it, if someone it, is, is... I don't know how people pay, you know, borrow money, buy retail, and then pay contractor prices uh, and, uh, and, and make any money in this game. I, I think that's where people... I think that's where you really do get slumlords because I think the only thing that the only way you can make that work is just not do any maintenance. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I don't I don't see how you can possibly make a profit unless you're you know buying cheap, borrowing money cheaply, and finding a way to do maintain properly but without spending a fortune on it. Yeah. So if you're if you're working with people, and build a good relationship with those contractors, and you're, yeah. and they know that you're going to pay them fairly, and you're going right. to give give them some uh, fair amount of work, then right. then you can you can make money doing that, and that's a that's a good approach to take. Yeah, and they tell their friends, you know, uh, this this handyman guy, he he knows everybody in the city. It seems like, and <laughs> any any it, not only does he have every part in his truck, he he every weird little skill you need you know if you if you need some guy who does the most ridiculous you know a skyhook removal guy he'll uh, wow. he's got one you know and he's not he didn't remove bees though no I, I, that's the only I, thing that's, he doesn't do apparently. that's the first thing we found <laughs> yeah. if he'd had to he would have figured it out and we're going to get into a little bit more detail uh, regarding landlording and and how these guys are, are making a successful business out of it here in indianapolis And we're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a second. Welcome back to Real Talk. I am Ron Watson, president of the board of directors of Cyria. And today we're speaking with Pete and Isaac Barrows, owner of Parrot Homebuyers and Brett Snodgrass with SimpleWholesaling.com. So guys, I wanted to take it down the thread. We, We touched on this a little bit and I didn't get a an opportunity to do a shameless Cyria plug just yet. So I thought we'd tie this back into Cyria a little bit, but I mean, at Cyria, uh, we try to uh, emphasize a code of ethics in terms of real estate investing. And I know you guys talked a little bit about trying to bring people into the neighborhoods that you're working with that are going to be good neighbors. And can you kind of go down that path a little bit more? And cause I, I don't think that's a perspective that uh, is often discussed uh, much in in, in uh, the common discussions or media that we see. So, can you talk a little bit about that? A little bit more detail around that, if you would. Well, I would say um, one thing I didn't even mention actually earlier. When I talk about good neighbors, you know, a lot of our houses are duplexes. So obviously, and they're symmetrical. Most of them, we I think we have a couple corner duplexes, but most of them are side by side. So I mean, if we move in a bad a bad tenant who's a bad neighbor not only will that affect the neighborhood it will also affect our other tenant who lives in the other half of the house which will make us look worse not only in the neighborhood but also to our own tenants so so you know one thing that's been uh, huge for us is is uh you know good neighbors uh and i think one reason it's it's uh very important uh, is you will get calls uh and and one thing you don't want is uh, a bad reputation for you know people in the neighborhood saying, "Oh, you, you know these guys, they move in bad tenants, and you know they threw trash in my yard." I mean, we had one. Uh, I think I briefly mentioned we had one noise complaint, probably two or three weeks ago, and basically the problem was the the neighbor who is our tenant was you know up late at night and and you know making lots of noise and and not keeping general track of you know of the cleanliness of not only the inside but the outside of our house which was affecting the neighbor uh so i mean once you start having tenants like that uh you know you'll get a bad reputation and and you know in especially in this day and age the worst thing you can have is not only word of mouth but you know if it if it gets to the internet uh you know and you start having a bad sort of i guess i would call it word of screen uh, you know, that's, that's just as bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was actually looking up this management company, uh, researching one time and I looked up, they had 25 reviews, all one star. I was like, wow. Wow. It's pretty consistent. That adds up to 25 stars. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. 
be five stars if they only had five yeah. reviews. <laughs> well, and it, and, it, and it goes the other way too. I mean, we have houses that you know people see us in there working. You know, we'll, we'll buy a house and be in there working on it, and people will come around and see what we're doing. They're like, "Oh, I'm so glad this place is getting fixed up." And they mm-hmm. come inside and they see how nice it is, and then they're like, "Hey, I've got a friend who would like to have this place." Nice. So yeah, it, it's almost invariably in business that you know doing something that's good for other people is good for you too and vice versa and yeah. and when you're when you're in this business and you're a landlord who wants to buy multiple multiple properties you do have i don't want to say the power but you do have the control over saying you know i want to buy i want to buy these houses i want to do it right and i want to move in good tenants and when you do that it it benefits it benefits you obviously because you have a good tenant who will pay but also, it benefits the neighborhood, which in turn also benefits you because of the neighborhood in which your rental sits is improving partially because of you know your contributions. Definitely. Um, I really want to dive into, you guys are a father-son uh, business or mom-and-pop business. And uh, uh, basically, I have some statistics here that says 75% of the rentals in our state are owned by mom-and-pop. And I feel like the industries in a whole... You know, we we talked about the grocery stores uh, a little bit, and I remember, you know, when I was a kid, I used to go up to my corner, Richie's Grocery, and it was really cool, just mom and pop, but then Walmart came in and other grocery stores, and then now it's not there anymore. Um, so what do you guys see in this industry, real estate, is landlording rentals, are mom and pop uh, businesses like yourself super important, or do you see some huge business coming in, owning thousands of rentals and, and taking over this whole thing well i would i would just say uh i'll start and i'll kick to him i would i would say that you know i know i know obviously there are a lot of big holding companies that have you know probably more rentals than we do and more probably rentals than than we plan to have uh but i would say when you're a family business uh you you have sort of a commitment to each other because you're related uh, so, you know, you'll naturally, you'll be more inclined to help each other out and to, to watch each other's back and also to, you know, preserve whatever it is you're trying to build, build together. So I would say when you're, when you're a family business, you're just, you're just more likely to, uh, have that commitment, uh, you know, financially and just, you know, mentally to each shareholder and each person who's in the business. Uh, so I would say that's, that's something that, uh. I think exists in family businesses that doesn't always exist in, in big, you know, businesses that buy up, you know, 300 rentals. So mm-hmm. there, there are some big companies that have come in here and bought, I don't know, a thousand houses. And that does, that does make it harder for everyone else. Uh, but there still seems to be room for a lot of little people uh, like us to go around and scoop up stuff around the margins. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just have to be opportunistic. Like, you know, that's why the Chinese uh, respect rodents. They go around and find the little crumbs and make a living off of them. And that's kind of uh, a good business model. <laughs> uh, there's still plenty of room in this business for, for the little guy to go around and who wants to go get two or three or four houses. Uh, we've got more than that, but there, uh, there seems to be a huge interest in this. And there seem to be a lot of people who want to be small investors in this business. And, uh, there's, uh, there's a place for them. Yeah. It really seems like it's kind of hard to, I mean, it'd be one thing to buy a bunch of houses and own them. Right. But, but to do what you guys are doing, I mean, you have to have the boots on the ground yeah. and you have to be able to go see that property and get in there and dig around, see that water heater needs to be replaced and, you know, what needs to be painted. And you can't do that from California. I mean, you got to be able to be in that property. Well, and I, well, around. I actually think some of these bigger companies that have bought literally, you know, 500 to 1,000 houses, I think that's what eventually happens to them. You can't possibly move into a city, buy 1,000 houses, hire 1,000 contractors, you know, the price of work would triple uh, if you did that. You know, you uh, you just can't scale the business like that. And I think that's what they're finding out and they're failing. So, yeah, I think it's it doesn't know. really work like Walmart. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, the boots on the ground, uh, the personal rapport relationship, it's it's huge. And uh, we've seen businesses that try to scale like that um, make mistakes and uh, they can't they just don't have the capacity to. You know, when things go down, so... Um, yeah. And then everybody's mad at them, and nobody wants to do business with them. And, right. you know, the city's fining them for 
not getting their lawns mowed, and uh, right. it just doesn't work. Hey, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you mentioned the word relationships, and we talked a little bit about that. Can you talk uh, maybe just a minute about how your relationship with Syria has benefited you in this process? Oh, I was sitting back. I thought I thought it was his question. Uh, Syria does a lot of educational stuff, uh, meetups and so forth. That uh, where there are always presentations. I uh, I seldom miss one, but uh, in truth, I'm not usually there for the education because I get that from my sons. Uh, it's probably extremely valuable if you don't have people around you who know a lot about real estate. So there's that. But uh, I go there because uh, there are other people there who are in this business. Um, and I never go away from one of those meetups without having met, uh, you know, another half dozen people. I guess that's why they call them meetups. And, uh, you know, I always leave with a handful of business cards and I try to follow up. And, uh, for, for me, it's all about just connecting with, uh, other people who do something such that we might be helpful to each other. For other people, it might be more about the education or the resources like that. Um, but for us, it's about, you know. Just, I guess you'd call it networking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's definitely helped us. I think people forget, uh, too, what Syria offers. It offers the networking, the education, and it has a lot of people in the service industries mm. where you can connect with them. If I'm looking for an insurance agent, uh, I actually just met up with a guy who's actually on the radio show named Justin, and he buys and sells notes, and I had a couple of notes and met with him, and I wouldn't have known him if it wasn't for Syria. Right. Um, you know, contractors, uh, whatever you're kind of looking for, it offers, it connects you to a lot of people that you need, right? Yeah, in, yeah. In at these business. meets, you know, there'll you, they'll be tables set up, and you walk around, there'll be a guy who installs garage doors. Yeah. <laughs> there'll be another guy who does mortgages and another guy who does insurance. So it's, it's really one-stop shopping for uh, what you need to be in this business, as well as a place to, you know, like I said, meet mentors or sellers or buyers or whatever you're yeah. looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing we try to f- stress is the, you know, you talked about the, we talked about the mom and pop aspect of this business and that there's lots of opportunity there and, but you really can't do it by yourself, right? I mean, you do need to have a team, whether they're directly on your team or an indirectly with this, this guy in the truck who has everything you need in his truck. I mean, those are people you need <laughs> two to of know. Everything. He's got yeah. two of everything. <laughs> I mean, those are the kind of people that you need to know. We need to get a. I'll have to mention this to Vicky. We need to get a beekeeper in the. Yeah, yeah there the, should be a station. Hey, there should be a staff. Beekeeper. There's an opportunity yeah, there. Yeah, we're yeah, missing. Yeah, yeah. but uh, <laughs> they get one job a year. Yeah. That's right. They get, <laughs> but man, I tell you, uh, it's funny the guy. The guy who came out and did it. He he just he, he even said, you know, you could pay me if you want, but <laughs> this was fun. <laughs> yeah, usually that's that's they're, they're, they're there for the bees. I mean, the bees are actually. We we will next segment we'll talk about beekeeping, Vicky, if that's okay. Uh, but we're gonna take a quick break. Actually, after this comes the thing that you guys have been waiting for. You've been through it once, so you, you survived, and they came back, and that's the hot seat the, segment, the warm seat. Yes, uh, yeah. the lukewarm <laughs> seat with uh, Brett and I. So we're gonna take a quick break and have a couple messages. We'll be right back in just a minute. Welcome back to our final segment of Real Talk today. I am Ron Watson, president of the board of directors of Syria, and today we're speaking with Pete and Isaac Barrow, owners of Parrot Home Buyers. And also joining us is Brett Snodgrass with Simple Wholesaling. So this is the segment that some fear, some you know, can't wait shaking to get in to. their boots, They're shaking over there. And this is a hot seat segment. So I want to start off with. Uh, just fire away right away here with a question about family business. I, I've heard a little discussion before the break how people were losing teeth in your family. And I, and I don't know if any of that's <laughs> happening now with the uh, business as it is today. But does it present any challenges for you guys working as a, as a family business, you know, and, and, or or not? I really can't think of any. I mean, but then I'm the old guy, and I love being around my kids. They probably have exactly the opposite sentiment. So uh, <laughs> it might be they, they might find it extremely challenging just to have me around all the time. But uh, so who I'm, who wears the pants in the f- business? That's that's a great hot seat. I would say it's there. pretty evenly distributed. Yeah. I mean, Sam Sam does. Uh, Sam is the older brother who's not here. He he barks a lot of orders out, and then we carry them out. So it might be him, but no one's really. Uh, everyone has uh, their own little fiefdom, their own little power center, and 
they don't overlap too much. So nobody, uh, nobody has to, you know, there's not a lot of squabbling around the water cooler. There's not even a water cooler. Uh, <laughs> no, everyone, I, I, I hate to disappoint you, but everyone gets along pretty well. There's really not a lot of, right. a lot Isaac? of dirt. Maybe you yeah. should have asked him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to sort of piggyback on what he was saying, yeah, I mean, he's absolutely right. Uh, I mean, Sam sort of runs the big picture stuff, the, the future planning, the five-year planning, all that stuff. Uh, and I'm in charge of the wholesaling, the management, the sort of the tenant stuff. And Dad is in charge of, of the construction along with the guy who he does all the work with, obviously. So yeah, I mean we we uh we we get along. I know that's probably not very exciting, but no, that's uh, good. I mean the the important part is you guys know where your where your roles are and yeah, you stick. That's in your very lane. important. If there were if if that wasn't clearly defined, then the, then yes, there can be. You know, if if you're in a family business where everybody's sort of commingling with each other, also uh, dad does a lot of the networking stuff. If the roles weren't very clearly defined, yes, there can be. Tension. Although I was thinking that you guys need to be coming and, and doing building, you know, one day a month. I was reading about how in Europe the executives have to go work in the factory like uh, one day every four months, which is very little. But uh, they want to see what the reality of it is. So, uh, yeah, that if you want some conflict, check back in a month or so when I <laughs> yeah. tried to tried to make them come yeah. pound nails. <laughs> <laughs> no, sounds good. Uh, next hot seat question. Uh, we're just going to do some rapid fire here. So one question that I get a lot is renting or leasing versus lease option. Um, what's your take on that? What is a lease option and w- which one do you prefer and why? We've we've never done lease options. Uh, we've always done just renting out our homes on a, you know, for a one year lease uh, and I mean, we we don't really have enough experience with lease options to know all the finer details, uh, but what we've always preferred renting. In terms of why, um, well, I mean, we believe that, you know, when when we rent something, I mean, we believe we're we're giving them a quality product, and and we've heard a lot of bad stories about lease options. People who would who would uh, you know get a lease option and then, you know didn't keep their their end of the bargain basically mm-hmm. so so we've just heard too many stories to, to go down that road well also I, I don't think we own a single i mean the idea of a lease option is that the guy has the option to buy it i, I don't think we have a single rental property that we really would want to get rid of we've been we've been so it's been so much effort to find them and buy them and fix them mm-hmm. yeah, you're gonna have to pry our cold dead hands from around them to get them <laughs> Yeah, it's the same goes. <laughs> and I just I'll just explain because we've done a few lease options, and basically it's the same as uh, leasing out the property, but then giving the tenant an option right. to buy it at a certain price within a certain amount of time. Right. And as that could be a strategy for some people out there, we've done it a few times just because I don't know. Um, it just kind of depends. Some people might say that if you do give them the option to buy it, maybe they might care for the property a little bit more, kind of take right. more home ownership. But at the end of the day. Uh, with that, it comes. There's an end to it yeah. that you're not going to get cash flow for many years on end, right? So. so it's probably more of a strategy for someone who really wants to sell the house, right? But is willing to lease it lease in the it. meantime, That's true. rather than someone who wants to lease it but is willing to sell it. Usually, it's, definitely. Yeah. So I got a question for you regarding the, your your plans. Uh, you mentioned that. Uh, is, is it the other brother that's not here? Has, Sam. Sam. He has more of the uh, strategic vision process or pro, uh, goal in mind. Do, what are you guys planning to do in the next five years? Are you going to continue down the same path? Or are you going to try to expand and do some other things? Or you know, how do well, you we see would, that happening? We would have to ask him, but he lives in a castle on top of yeah, a he, rocky mountain. Yeah, where make appointments to you get in can't, there. Yeah, yeah you, you, you can't get there from here. Uh <laughs> What are we going to do in the next five years? I think we're working so hard we don't have time to think about it too much. We're going to get more rental properties. That's what we're going to do. And uh, we're going to pay attention to what the market does and says. And if things go down, we'll buy. And if things go up, we'll sell. And if things go sideways, we'll run for the hills. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think I think one thing that's been uh, very important for us over the last even two years has been just adjusting. There's I mean, in terms of five-year plans, we have rough five-year plans. We have goals we want to reach. Uh, We have, you know, numbers we want to hit. But, you know, if if the market changes, uh, 
you know, things will change. Uh, you know, our, our focus will change. I mean, obviously now our focus is, is building our rental portfolio, fixing our rent- rental portfolio and wholesaling. And, you know, if, uh, if, you know, the market changes that, that, that sort of mission will, will change a little bit, just like it changed when we decided to start wholesaling. So it, it just depends on the market. We'll adjust. Uh, but our, as of now, our plan is to continue wholesaling and to continue buying rentals for ourselves. And like they say, if your plan goes wrong, you got to get yourself another plan. We had a plan a few years ago, but it, it didn't include wholesaling. <laughs> yeah. And here your we plans are. plans are always changing. The market yeah. changes. Yeah. You Each year, you have to revisit that. Uh, definitely. So I, I'm curious. I know there's people out there who may be interested in, in taking a similar path, maybe getting into landlording, but they're concerned about Brian Cranston showing up one of their properties <laughs> operating meth labs. Has that happened to you guys? We've been lucky enough that that specifically has not happened to us, and we haven't had really any. We haven't had really any severe, you know, bears of an issue uh, as of yet. Uh, obviously, we've only been landlording these houses for about two years, but as of yet, I mean, we haven't really had. We've been pretty lucky. I mean, we, for one. We inherited some tenants, uh, and and we've also moved our own in. And as of now, I mean, we haven't had too many severe issues like you know criminal activity. Uh, so well, so it, we've been. It, it's not luck though. It's it's the fact that it, we we did inherit some tenants from people who didn't screen their tenants at all, and we've had some problems with them. But once Isaac took over the leasing and screening, we've had no problems at all with those people. Awesome. Uh, last hot seat question, and I had, I had twenty five more, but go oh, ahead. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're we calling the segment. That's all right. <laughs> so uh, tenants give communities sometimes there's a negativity around it. Yeah. I know we just my wife and I just put our house up for sale, and a big company was looking at it to pay cash for it, and our thinking was oh, they're going to move a tenant in here, and it's going to bring down the community or something, uh, but it's very needed, right? So can you talk to us about how does landlording and buying rental properties help communities? Put a positive spin on all that. Well, if the statistic you were saying is true, that 75% of rentals are owned by small family businesses, uh, imagine those were all gone. What would that do to the price of rentals? Uh, first of all, I mean, they just, those rentals wouldn't exist, uh, uh, would be the first thing and then what would happen you know someone would come into the market uh and probably charge more so uh the more the more people who want to go into this business i think the better for the community the more more people who want to be landlords the lower rents get Mm -hmm. um so uh I, i don't see a downside to that at all for the community um and a lot of houses out there couldn't really they don't really fit the profile of home ownership maybe mm. the area that they're in they're more of just they're a good rental home uh, yeah for well i guess i guess areas trend as they come up they transition into fewer renters and more uh more homeowners but there are plenty of very mixed neighborhoods most of the places we own mapleton fall creek there are a lot of homeowners there there are a lot of renters i don't know what the numbers are i think also <clears throat> it's uh it's important to uh <clears throat> put yourself in the shoes of the people who are next to the tenant you're moving in. Because, I mean, obviously, before you're a landlord, you're a homeowner. And I think everybody knows what it's like to have a disruptive neighbor. So you have to. I think you have to put yourself in the shoes of, you know, would I want to live next to this person? Uh, and I think it's uh, important to sort of empathize with, you know, all the people who are affected. And I think, like I mentioned earlier, when, when you are a landlord, you have the capability to very much, you, you have the, you have, sort of the neighborhood in your hands a little bit because you're able to you're able to have some control about how it looks when you when you put your whatever tenant you decide to put in there which which helps you but it also helps helps the neighborhood so so brett i i think uh, we're going to call that segment uh, a wash we didn't break them exactly <laughs> yeah. but i think there was a beat I, of I wish sweat we had, on the brow. i wish we had some tenant horror stories so, uh, <laughs> that's all right i'm sorry to disappoint not at all that's actually a good thing i mean just, i actually uh, rather just made those calls yeah so brett before we do the tip of the week i would like to get your contact information in case somebody wants to uh, reach out to you yeah, the best place to reach us is our website at simplewholesaling.com. And basically what we do is we buy uh, houses for cash fast. If you're looking to sell a house and you don't want to go through all the headaches of um, 
you know, getting inspections, getting an agent, paying out commissions or any closing costs or the company to go to, simple wholesaling. You can also find properties that we're looking to sell. So if you're looking uh, to buy a rental or flip, go to our website at simplewholesaling.com and all of our contact information is on there. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, do you have a tip of the week for the listeners? Uh, my tip of the week, since we're talking landlording, is to keep a good attorney on uh, on speed dial because uh, <laughs> it's it's important uh, to not only have a baseline understanding uh, of the law, but I think it's also important to, even if you have any doubt at all about what you can and can't do as a landlord, talk to an attorney. Uh, you know, I, I understand some people don't want to deal with attorneys because you might have to pay for filing fees or you might have to just pay for advisement uh but it's it's well worth it if you it's well worth talking to an attorney and paying him 100 bucks 200 bucks as opposed to thinking you know the law and then realizing you know the law after you talk to an attorney who just told you you didn't actually know the law (laughs) so so i think uh talk to an attorney uh you know whenever you have any doubt about what you can and can't do can you give us some contact information if people want to reach out to you guys? Sure. Uh, you can reach us. Our website is parrothomebuyers.com. We're also on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Uh, and you could reach us at 317-204-2900. Thank you, Pete and Isaac. And also thank you very much, Brett, for joining us. This week at Cyria, we have our monthly main meeting on Thursday the 12th. It's normally on the first Thursday of the month, but this month we have a new date due to the holiday. And on Saturday the 14th, we have a full day of class going over investing, analyzing tools, strategies for getting into commercial investing. You can find out more about these events and our other events by going to www.cyria.org and or clicking on the calendar of events. Thanks again, gentlemen, for joining us. And remember that if you want to learn more about this information, Secrets to Success, please come visit us at a Cyria meeting. Thanks again.